Test one, two. Okay, I should be audible. Rather than Johan, can you say something? I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, can you hear me now? On uh, Also on the Twitch? I'm testing audio also from here. And also please let us know if our volume levels are differing. Yeah. Y y yours is rather high. Mm. To me, Johan and Radovan seem sort of balanced, but okay. both may be a bit high. But we really need to have the streamers let us know. Yeah, I lowered it a bit. Okay. So maybe we don't have many people here yet, but this is the live stream course. And we are starting off. So the point of what we're doing is to really demonstrate how we've been giving courses online. So there probably won't be many people in the audience, but still, well, what better way than to self-demonstrate? And also we will, we will record this first session. So it will also be useful yes. for posterity. Uh, we have changed the material a lot uh, compared to previous instructor training workshops. So this, this really evolved out of instructor training workshops. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an opportunity now to test the new material, improve it further. And we plan, we, we plan further workshops, also bigger workshops uh, using this material. Yeah. So we have a HackMD, which is one of the core online technologies that we've been using. Um, I will screen share it here. And if yeah. you have registered to this to this workshop, then you have you have received an email from me with the link to the HackMD. Mm -hmm. So please open it up because um, everybody who got the link can can edit, and we will use this to ask questions, comment, uh, when we do exercises and discussions, uh, this is really our way to involve the audience yeah. live. So here we see it. Uh, we'll go a little bit more into it later, but if you scroll down to the bottom, you see attendees icebreakers. So if you come up to the top and click the pencil icon to go to edit mode, then you can come down and fill in uh, And as you'll see, this is basically the core way that we manage to um, communicate with people. And, and we use this uh, approach a lot in our courses. We have used it in courses up to 300 participants. Mm -hmm. um, for So this is really our way to, to also ask how things are going. Mm -hmm. We will be also later, we will demonstrate how we use this to, to ask how the speed is. This is really our way to ask questions to the audience, but also to, to get questions and input live. And we really try to adjust to it live as we go. Yeah. I guess if you've been in one of our courses, this will make a lot of sense. And if not, it will by the time we're done. So don't worry too much. So what else can we comment? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so one aspect of the HackMD is that it is a platform which is scaling really well to a large number of participants. Mm. So we have experience of being up towards 100 persons being having the document open. Mm -hmm. Then ne nevertheless, it can be good if one if one is not editing, that one goes to so-called so view mode because that reduces slightly the load on, on the server. But today we don't expect, uh, we are not too many participants. We have 21 registrations. 
So we shouldn't experience any too high load on this. They should manage, manage it well. Um, yeah. We recommend everybody on HackMD to click to edit mode at least once. So I click at least once to edit mode. You can then go back to view mode, but then mm. oh, you make sure that the document updates itself as you view it. And then one way to participate, what we will discuss that also in a moment, is the, to have Twitch uh, open on one half of your screen and the HackMD on the other half of the screen or portion of your screen. And then you can watch and interact at the same time. But we will talk about screen layouts for learners, participants, but also screen layouts for instructors uh, in this in this short workshop. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see what else. I guess we can introduce ourselves a little bit once the official time starts. So in the live stream courses, we often do this. So we'll tell people that the connecting time is 10 minutes before the actual lesson start time, which sort of gets people coming. But as far as we're concerned, it starts 10 minutes early. So we do these icebreakers discussions, like we'll talk about what we're learning. We'll chat about answers to questions from the previous day. We'll, well tell some stories or you know, begin briefing about the hack and D kind of stuff and so on. But then go through everything important again once the time starts. And really, we get this kind of, um, we get most people joining a little bit early to attend these icebreakers sessions. And I think it's really important. I mean, when someone's presenting in a lecture hall, do you keep the door closed until the very last minute and then let people in and start talking right away? Well, Oh. Yeah, I really like this. I like this, the fact that we open the room earlier. Also, I like the fact that we typically leave the room open after the workshop. Mm -hmm. I like that much better than using a, a waiting room in Zoom and then opening up the waiting room like one second before the start. Right. Because people need to orient, they need to set up the windows. So they also, maybe they, maybe they see the HackMD for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then the um, icebreaker question is already a way to get get used to it. Yeah, let's see. Mm. Yeah, I guess we talk about Code Refinery in a bit. Mm. Yeah, I think it will be part of the part of the welcome. Yep. Yeah. But really, also all questions welcome. Questions about yeah. teaching our workshops about Code Refinery project itself. So on on HackMD, we'll yeah. be watching this. Um, you can always add new questions. We have found it really useful to number questions. So this is something that we mm -hmm. learned from a participant. So we will number questions, add new questions on uh, at the bottom of the document, and we or somebody else can answer, and we can even have like a threaded discussion. And, and to facilitate that, we have, when we are a large number of uh, participants, then we have a dedicated person or persons that are managing the HackMD to, to make sure that content uh, is ending up in the right place and, and then edit if needed. Yeah. And, and one thing that we do with the, with the HackMD content is that we uh, directly after one session, we will uh, post process it and uh, yeah, for instance, clean it up so that if there are person names in it, we will remove them. Um, of course, that for the, for the sake of, of web publishing, it, it's better to have it anonymous. Yeah. And then also you make general editing for clarity. And, uh, and then we Often have it up just one or two hours after a workshop session, yeah. so people can re one can then revise it uh, already on before next day's uh, sessions. Should we begin? 
So, yes. uh, how do we usually begin a workshop? I guess we can share, well, hmm, who's doing the welcome? So I think I according to plan, you do the welcome, okay. but uh, together with me. So yeah. we will we will try to do all sessions at least as a duo or as a trio. Mm -hmm. Then we can fill in what uh, we can fill in. We can help each other out. We can ask each other questions. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, I'll start. So welcome everyone who's made it here, who's found the way. Um, this is the Code Refinery Community Teaching Workshop, which was the latest version of what we used to call instructor training. But now we're sort of more emphasizing this, like it's not just about the teaching part, but the whole how you teach along with the community. So you've gotten a link in the registration to this HackMD. So if you come up here, you can switch to edit mode and then you can right here. So we're going to talk a little bit more about HackMD during the first part, but basically it's like Google Docs, but with Markdown. Um, the exact tool doesn't really matter, but the point is down here at the bottom, people can, like it, it's like a parallel chat or multi-threaded chat or two-dimensional chat. So people can have many different discussion threads going on at the same time. What you need to know for now is that if you have a question or comment, scroll to the bottom, switch to edit mode, and then add your question as another number down here. And we have people watching, all of us instructors, or at least some of us while we're teaching, we also have this open. And we can see your question and then bring it up anonymously in the mainstream, or someone can answer it right there. Uh, and maybe we should also start by introducing ourselves. Yes, um, let's do that. So we are three people here in the sort of TV studio streaming to, to Twitch. Maybe I can start. So my name is Radovan Bast, University of Tromso, Norway, um, working with the Code Refinery project since the start, 2016. Um, I see my role as partly resource software engineer, support for research, and teaching and coordinating uh, this teaching project. And with me is in this first session is Richard and Johan. Later we are many more, but maybe Richard and Johan can also introduce. Yeah. So I'm Richard Darst. I work at Aalto University in Finland. I've been on and off involved with Code Refinery since maybe 2018 or 2017, something like that. And these days, my role at my main job is, well, I do two main things. One is research software engineer kind of stuff. And the other role is basically teaching and support. Uh, Johan. Yes, so uh, my name is uh, Johan Helsvik. I work as an application expert at uh, the PDC Center for High Performance Computing at K8 in Stockholm. And I've been uh, part of Code Refinery since 2020 and, uh, and enjoy very much the teaching in, in this format and, and modality. Um, at PDC, I'm having uh, a lot of general uh, duties to the support community and with a particular niche towards uh, condensed matter physics and materials science. Yeah, so during this workshop, the first hour is the live stream demo while we're doing the sort of lecture teaching part. So we'll go through the different material we have and sort of lay out the different aspects that Code Refinery has developed over the years. And then the second hour is more hands-on. So we'll go and actually look at some of these things in more detail and you can try to get set up and do some exercises preparation for your teaching. And then the last hour is a discussion time. And only the first hour is live stream. The other hours are in Zoom. And we will do breaks between these sessions. Yes. So every hour we plan a 10 minute break. Also, um, Richard is sharing now the HackMD document. On top of the HackMD document, you find all the important links. Also yes. linked to our code of conduct, but also linked to the material, which we'll be loosely following. 
and then also the link to the Zoom room for the hands-on sessions Yeah, in hours two and three. So should we go to the material now? Let's go to the material. Maybe we can start with uh, if in going into the welcome section of the material. Yeah. And there I can maybe start with a, with a question to all of us. What is the goal? What is our goal for this workshop? Mm -hmm. Let's Why do see. we do this? Yeah. And thanks again for joining. So Radovan, should I leave the screen share going? Or would you like to take it? it? So if it's convenient for you, you can keep it until we switch. So also for the, so we will do a little overview. What is the goal? Then uh, yeah. we will talk about the tools. Maybe mm -hmm. you can keep it while doing that. And then later yeah. I can take it for when we discuss mm -hmm. workshop organization. Yeah, sounds good. So if that works for you. Okay. And what, what are our goals for this first session and for this workshop? So why do we do this? Yeah. So mm, was that a question to me? Or yeah, to, or to us, of... but I can also answer, but uh, yeah, but yeah, maybe you, maybe you can. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say the question again? I was a bit distracted. Uh, okay, so maybe I can start with what, what is the goal for this workshop? And maybe I can start answering what the goal is for me is that it's really the community aspect. It's not so much the previous versions of this training were focused on how to teach our lessons. Mm -hmm. I think here the focus is a bit different and I really like it. The focus is more about how and why community workshops and how and why co-teaching mm -hmm. and how do we, what is our tool set? Why do we use this live stream? And how do we use a live stream in combination with Zoom? Mm -hmm. And what are the advantages? What are the challenges? Yeah. So th these are the goals for me. And also the, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, for me, the goal is not that we tell everybody how to do things. I think that the goal for me is that we, we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we also hear from participants through HackMD and later in the hands-on yeah. sessions. And we learn what are their tricks and tools and solutions. And we all learn something new. Yeah, I pretty much agree. I mean, this is this material is still well. We're always learning, and this material isn't perfect right now. But it does sh say what we know so far, and we hope to improve it based on what we find here. I think that also part of the workshop is that. These practices are not just for professional teachers. So many of us need to teach as part of our job. Um, yeah, so we're not trying to uh, make something that's perfect for the people that are like doing this primarily, but you know, all the people that have some other skills but need to teach and mentor others. And it's so much easier to do that together with other people. And there is this nice quote about giving confidence. And we try to do that both when, when teaching courses, our, one of the main goals is to give learners confidence in, in using and learning the tools. Uh, the goal is not to, to make us expert in whatever tools we, we teach. And I think the same thing goes for instructing and teaching and organizing to give each other confidence to well team up and teach together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I could fill in with this as well. One other aspect uh, of the, this community form of teaching is this that we iteratively extend and revise the contents of, of, our, of our lessons. And uh, that in itself is, is an opportunity for, for practicing many of, of the things that, that we're teaching. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, we can also inspire and motivate some of you to join for some of our future workshops yeah. and teach and organize together. Um, if you scroll down, I just wanted to mention that code of conduct, we have a link there. Um, and this is something we always mention at every workshop, but it's also, it's not only about how we treat each other as humans. And that's very, very important in, our, in an online workshop or an in-person workshop. 
but it's also about the little things like the volume. So if our if our volume is not, if we are hard to understand, please let us know via HackMD. If if the font size is too small, um, if something is confusing, not enough breaks. Also, this becomes easier to detect when when we are more than one instructor. So then the other co-instructors can help and and tell, please in increase the font size. How about a break? Yeah. So please let us know if something is can be improved. Yeah. Should we go on then? Let's see. Let's do let's do that. I think next on the line, maybe we can say we two three sentences about the Cortana project itself. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, a project that started 2016. We have funding until 2020, 2025. Uh, this is a Nordic project, but our goal is to now take it beyond the Nordics. And already in past workshops, we have managed to really engage groups also outside of Nordics, participating as teams, as exercise leads, as instructors. And the goal of this project is to bring these kind of workshops for the community, so teaching tools in resources for engineering, teaching tools in FAIR, uh, software development. Uh, but one of the project goals is to, to form a community and to form a network which, which can carry these, uh, these workshops beyond the funding period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh... I guess people can read the rest of us. Should we go on to the good part? Yeah, I think looking at the timing, maybe we can move on to, uh, first we will discuss a bit the tools that we use and later workshop organizations and lesson design development. Yeah, okay. So, um... There's a question in HackMD, is video buffering message? Is it our side? I don't see any video buffering here or in my Twitch preview. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. So, teaching tools. So, Radovan, would you like to take the screen share here? I can take the screen share if you lead the talking. Yes, uh, sounds good. All right, just a sec. And it will take me a second or two, and later I will discuss more about why that takes maybe a second or two. But let me adjust here. So you notice that the, the screen share is vertical. We might comment on it in a second. I just want to make sure that so on top, I show the material and on the bottom I will open up the I will open up the HackMD so that we can see both and we can see questions as they come in. I just need to move also some of the other windows out of my way. So here I'm opening up the HackMD and I will so as we now stream and record, um, please don't use any names. Let's keep it really anonymous so that I can share this. And yes. what we now um, do, and we really try to follow the same approaches in, in our like normal workshops is that in the HackMD we will add sections so that if people are distracted or if they join later, they can find where we are. So right now we are, we will add a new section on tools and we, all, we will also add a link on, on where, where we are so that you can find it. Yeah. And whatever question you may have, always write it at the bottom. So don't go up to a previous section um, because then we might not see it. Okay, teaching tools, teaching online. So I think this was sort of a summary point. So using HackMD, let's do this quick little exercise or let's see what we can do. So. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah. 
So I've just gone and filled out some spots. So please go and comment there. So Radovan, what do you think are the online teaching, the biggest online teaching advantages? The biggest advantages from my perspective are that we can we can reach many more people. So workshop our workshops are at least one order of magnitude larger than in person. Mm -hmm. So not on, not only we can reach a larger audience um, geographically and in number, uh, we can also. Uh, it turns out that it is easier to engage more organizers, instructors, and helpers because yeah. they don't need to travel. So it's cheaper. They also may have time only f to help two days out of six, but it's okay. We can we can match that up. Yeah. So we can reach more people. We can also onboard more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like for me, I sort of like the idea somehow. And what really struck me the most about when everyone went online two years ago was that I actually felt more engaged in my meetings and things like that. So why is that? Because no longer is a single stream of voice the limiting factor in talking to people. So basically we can be meetings and instead of needing to find the gap and then say my thing and then um, you know interrupt someone else, you can write it in chat. Or as we've learned in uh, Code Refinery, we use HackMD. So basically now look, we have far more answers to advantages and disadvantages of online teaching than we would expect if we were in a single room and people can comment and basically everyone's talking at the same time. Yeah, good point. We get really more questions in in our workshops. We get over 100 questions every day and and from more people probably in, a, in an in-person workshop. It's often two, three people who ask questions mm -hmm. and many good questions to get never asked. Yeah. Uh, so should we go to the next sections and talk about how we make use of these advantages and disadvantages? I guess the first maybe biggest one is team teaching. So I know, Radovan, do you remember when we tried to team teach once in person here at Alto? At least that was, we were here, we we're teaching one of these Git courses in a code yeah, refinery workshop. Yes, I remember also the in which room. Yeah. And I think it was a good idea. I think it it was still not optimal. Yeah. I think like, we needed we needed some time and it became better later in online. Yeah. Yeah. So the basic idea there, well, a lot of a lot of my metaphors come from ship ships or something like that. But you only have a large enough vehicle you're driving. You have one person that's taking the actual controls and doing things, as in sort of doing the demos, doing the talking, things like that. And you have a different person that has the big overview of what's going on and sort of navigates through the lesson. So there's different strategies we've used here. So if you scroll down a little bit, so first off, you can see the primary article about team teaching there and read a lot more. But there's different strategies we've gotten. Like in some of our courses, we basically have one person that's typing for the demos, but they're not really saying much, and the other person that's telling them what to type. So it can sort of go faster, and then the person that's typing, when something's a little bit confusing, then they would ask, okay, why am I doing this? And so on. And that's really revolutionary. That's like basically the voice of the audience there that's speaking up. Uh, another example would be something like a interview where there's one person who's pretends to be the expert and one person that's pretending to be the learner. And then um, like they're, they're teaching as a discussion. And we can see it already here that, um, so I'm sharing screen. In fact, in this case, Richard knows the lesson better than me, but Richard navig will navigate me now. And yeah. it, it looks more natural. Um, also, I really like this, having this vo voice of the audience because the, the second person can, mm -hmm. can, can pause, can 
ask something that has been maybe confusing. The other way I like to think about it, it's it's like watching a sports game and there are two there are very often two commentators mm -hmm. and they have a discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's I I have a feeling that this is more engaging to for the audience. It's also nicer to hear two or three voices instead of one one voice for the for the entire day or half day. Yeah. Should we go on? Yes, we can I go on. Also, the, there... the role of this other person is to have a look at the hack and yeah. ease, which mm -hmm. I'm having a look. So thanks a lot for for keeping the questions coming. There's a comment in HackMD, co-teaching is very confusing. Does that mean like what we're saying now, like being able to follow us or the idea of how you would do it? So I think that by now, like it's, it really is something that takes a little while to begin understanding how it really works. But after you see it some, um, I think most of our instructors are really a big fan of it somehow. Also, it's great for onboarding new instructors because it really reduces the amount of, um, yeah. Okay. Should we continue then? Well, let's continue, but I really pre I also appreciate the comments on the yeah. co-teaching. Nice to yeah. see that it's also maybe yeah. not like a, not the way I see it. That's very good. Are we going so, to uh, discuss this exercise or should I skip to the next episode let's here? Let's skip to the next part. We can go over these later. Okay. Okay. HackMD. HackMD. Um, Radovan, can you, what do you think of HackMD? I guess we've already said most of these things here. Yeah, it's really a way to parallelize questions. The, way, the reason we use it is we have everything in one place um, on if if we if we would use a Zoom chat for instance, it would be all linearized. You cannot really talk about several things at the same time. Um, so we can parallelize questions, mm -hmm. but it comes also at a, at a price because the price for uh, having this document is that you need to have this document somewhere on your screen. So we are aware that our screen space is limited, and. Not everybody has two, three screens. I mean, I'm now participating in this workshop with, with a laptop, with one single screen, mm -hmm. and it takes away space. It also may take away attention. One mm -hmm. thing we have seen is that sometimes it becomes a bit too successful and a bit too interesting. Sometimes we have very interesting questions and very interesting discussions on HackMD, but then what can happen is that I sometimes watch these questions and answer, and it's very engaging, but I get distracted and I forget to to watch the live stream and I, I didn't listen for a few moments and I get a bit lost. So then I don't know where are we, what was discussed right now. Yeah. So that's the, the these are the challenges. Yeah. And it's not specific to HackMD, like any of these online services could be used. We've just started using HackMD somehow and maybe we could reevaluate if that's good. Maybe I can mention that uh, the other thing that we like about services like HackMD is that they introduce Markdown, which mm -hmm. is the, the 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 markup syntax, in a um, in a kind of passive way. We don't have to really explain even how bullet points work and how numbering works and how headings work, because if you mm -hmm. if you watch other people edit and you see the like the edit mode and view mode. We, we see that we learn it a little bit passively. And as uh, uh, many of our workshops go over several days, and then when we need Markdown, and when, when we need to talk about Markdown on, on day two, three, or on the second week, uh, many of the concepts have already been introduced. So that's another thing we like about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think there's maybe on these disadvantages for the flood of information like radovan was saying so at the beginning of our workshops we have to be very clear about hackmd will be here you can use it but it will be there'll be so much stuff there that 
if it's too much, don't watch it. Like, only watch it when you need to. Or if you want to. Like, some advanced people may be a little bit bored about what we're actually saying, but reading HackMD gives them a lot of engagement. And also good comments uh, coming in here. Well, I'll just scroll down because I'm about the additional overhead, not only additional screen space, but if you want to see edit and view mode at the same time, mm -hmm. you may need more than just half the screen. Yeah. For some, it may be too overwhelming to and too difficult to parse with mm -hmm. eyes the, uh, the markdown syntax. Yeah. So these are, um, it is an additional tool and these are additional possible barriers. Yeah. I would also be really happy to to learn about other tools that you maybe use in your projects, in your teaching, which you have found beneficial for questions and answers and comments. Yeah. Should we go on where we have so much to say, we can get to spend this in the discussion time. So Teams. So where did the idea of Teams come from anyway? Um, I think it was your idea. I guess. As many, as many really good ideas that stuck in the project. And the idea was that why don't we, Yeah. sometimes or, hmm. it's not an individual learner that joins the workshop, but yeah. it's uh, they come with their friends and colleagues yeah. from their research group. So why don't we let them participate yeah. in the workshop as a, as a team? And yeah. why don't we let them register as a team? Yeah. Although I remember hearing this initially from someone else. So someone in code refining once made the comment that research showed that if there were multiple people in a team learning a skill or a tool, the uptake in the whole team was usually much higher. So basically we emphasized coming with your colleagues. So allowed registration and we would put people in the same breakout rooms as the people they know and they worked with. Um, we'd formalize this more where the team could bring in their own exercise leader who would be guiding the rest of the people. So that way we don't have to like provide as many of our own exercise leaders or helpers. And this really allows us to, to scale at, at basically no extra cost. Of course, yeah. there is some extra cost because we need to onboard uh, mm -hmm. the exercise leads, but we really encourage teams to sign up Ideally, they come with their own exercise lead. Yeah. And the other advantages of having this concept is that teams often speak the same programming language. Mm -hmm. Often they speak the same academic discipline language. Mm -hmm. So they can have really meaningful discussions in the exercises um, uh, when, we, when we work on examples. Yeah. Um... And if we tried to make our own teams, like a bunch of people sign up, sometimes we spent a long time organizing these hundred people into teams and it can become sort of overwhelming. But um, yeah, let's go on, I guess. We need to watch the time. Um, Yeah, I mean, there's so much content here. I don't think we can really possibly get to it. Do you have any other comments from these things? Oh, maybe I can also mention that we have, uh, what we have also found really interesting is that teams not only participate in the same, let's say Zoom breakout room, but sometimes teams show up in the same physical room. Mm -hmm. um, they can follow the workshop on the screen, on live share, and then do exercises together in the same room. I find this approach really interesting. But yeah. yeah, maybe I can scroll down and also commenting on the scrolling. I'm aware that I'm, I'm here scrolling often a wall of text. It can be it can be really overwhelming to watch it. And I appreciate the comment on HackMD. Maybe we should uh -huh. try some of the tools and mm -hmm. we have even developed some tools in-house that yeah. that render the text in a slide, uh, yeah. slide show form. And maybe we don't need to show all the details and yeah. the details can be unrolled. So there are many ways to present things. Yeah. So a thank a lot, thanks a lot for the comment. 
This last point for teams, there's a great point question, comment number eight here, in-person teams with local helpers. So even though we're broadcasting online, we encourage people to go meet with their own group friends in some physical room. So they're working together and then they can talk among each other, however, and then use HackMD to coordinate with others. And this, I think, is one of the ways of the future. Should we continue? Let's see. We are uh, live streaming. Yeah, this so why is... do we do this? Why do we use live stream and Twitch? Why not? Why didn't we all now meet in Zoom? What was the motivation for doing this? Yeah. So maybe there's several topics. Well, I guess it's written here. One is we can reach an unlimited number of people. I was really interested how once we all went online, the first thing people did is that, oh, we need to hide all of our Zoom links and make everything registration only because people might do bad things. Which to me, okay, like, yeah, people might do bad things, but also we have the technology in to, um, to reach, I mean, practically everyone on the planet in a course. So why don't we do that? But in order to do that, we need a way that's more one to many. So the idea is we have live streaming to go one to many so anyone can take part, even if we can't support them. And then we have things like HackMD in order to um, have the interaction among the people that are registered. And then of course, things like the in-person things. Um, by removing the learners from the uh, the instructor Zoom where we're talking, we can get clean recordings. So there's zero privacy risk here. So we can have these recordings and publish them without, like basically without fear. And once we can get these done quickly, then it sort of transforms the way people can attend. If you miss a day, it's no longer a disaster, but you can actually follow that up. And then once we get large, a lot of the other kinds of tools we have here can be used, like the HackMD or the co-teaching. So these work better when it's large. Um, and live streaming honestly can take a bit of work. Um, so I have this huge setup at my home to do the live streaming, but I think we can make it a bit easier where more people can manage it. But I guess we can talk more about this later. There's lots of different artic articles there. Oh, here's a nice picture. So the, the way it works, we have an instructor Zoom. So you probably see Radovan, Johan, and I are in a Zoom. It gets captured with OBS, Open Broadcaster Software which gets live streamed. And then we have these different ways of learners consuming it. So for example, people watching by Twitch, people can watch the recording later. There can be a learner Zoom where people are doing the breakout rooms and exercise sessions and so on. And basically overall, like by adding a little bit more to it, it's like making a clean separation between the instructing and the managing of the attendees. And once you have a few more people, then suddenly it unlocks a lot of scaling. And the feedback loop is the HackMD. Mm -hmm. And for us, it can be a bit strange because we are really two or three people in a, in a Zoom call. So we need mm -hmm. to imagine that there are, uh, hopefully there are some, somebody watching, <laughs> but, yeah. then, um, but then it's through the HackMD that we hear back how it's going. That's why yeah. it's so nice for us to see these questions and also nice for us to see these comments on, yeah. um, on how we can improve. Yeah. Like Radovan, would you say that we're having more interaction here than you would expect a typical small workshop? I think we, I think we do because it is, it is basically semi-anonymous. We we try to keep it as anonymous as possible, and it's mm -hmm. uh, we react to it. We try to react to it. Um, yeah. Immediately. Yeah. So I feel we have more questions and more interactions, but it yeah. is it takes some use to it takes some getting used to. Okay, so we should really try to go faster. We are a bit behind. So what's next? Um, instructor tech setup. So Radovan, I think you had a lot to say here, didn't you? 
or actually this is a lot of this is what we'll talk about in the second hour. But what are the points we can make right now? Um, yeah, to, to distill it. So one point is that we, we really prefer this, this portrait vertical screen share mm -hmm. instead of, uh, instead of a landscape horizontal screen share. And here we show the two versions. Yeah. Uh, because it allows participants, but also instructors to have something on the other half of the screen, mm -hmm. either to, to have the terminal open if it's, if it's a shell based course or the, I don't know, Jupyter notebook or the HackMD or to watch the, to scroll the material at on, on time and on, pay, on pace. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with some challenges as well. So it comes with challenges for recording. And if we want to watch it on YouTube, I guess, then well, I mean, it all works pretty well, I think. Um, yeah. If you watch on Twitch and if you haven't noticed yet, so there is this theater mode where, yeah. where you can make it really portrait. Yeah. And then there's things like the look of the prompt in the other windows on the screen. Um, and we will practice that. Um, we will talk about it more in the second hour, but here I just want to say that it really matters. It's something that we often set up at the very last sort of the one hour before the workshop, <laughs> but it really pays off to set it up a few days before mm -hmm. and get feedback and show it to other people. Yeah. And to have a high quality screen share really matters for the experience for the participants. Yeah. Uh, should we go on? Um, yes, yeah. so more about this in a bit. And I think we don't want to go faster, but we want to do, we want to just want to show the essence. So yeah. we have now looking at the time, we have something like 15 minutes left before the break. Mm -hmm. If I count correctly. Yeah. So I guess the next two sections, I can just very quickly say. So one is once you have the live stream set up, it's really easy to tell open broadcaster software to also record it. So I'm collecting this recording. As soon as it's done, I'll be able to um, publish it. And I don't have to go remove pictures of attendees, voice, whatever. And the next slide tells about how we edit it. So we developed a tool called FFmpeg edit list. So someone no longer has to learn how to use a video editor. Um, instead, by having a text file, you can define how you need to cut the video. And then it basically produces all of the different segments I need to upload them to YouTube. And my standard is whenever I do a big course, by every day midnight, I have all the videos on YouTube. And this basically works. And my philosophy is if it's not done within 24 hours, it's never going to be done. So, yeah. Okay, now I muted the wrong thing. Hopefully the right thing. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, so when you created this table of contents, so during a workshop, do you then take notes? Like, I don't know, 12, 39, they start talking about the video recording. How do you do that so that you don't have to rewatch the whole thing in the so, evening again? So I basically rewatch the whole thing, but I basically know what's been there so I can fast forward through and then take the edit points. Um, I have something that automatically copies the time. And the way people screen share actually really matters. Like you can share. And for example, as someone commented, the URL is in the screen. If the URL is not in the screen, then it really becomes a lot harder to process it. And I think also that means it's a lot harder for someone to watch it. So you really start noticing these small quality improvements doing that. Uh, but OK, we've got a few more quick sections to talk about. So oh, yeah, this was mentioned video editing. Here's, here you can also find links to this FFmpeg edit list that Richard mentioned. Yeah. So we talked about that. So next uh, is workshop organization. Yes. So here I can say a few words. Um, 
And we already discussed a little bit the co-teaching, but it's not only about co-teaching, it's also about co-organizing, which is the sick on you too. Sorry. All right, sorry for the interruption. So it's also about why, why organizing together, why teaching together. And some of these advantages we have already discussed. It's something we need to do anyway, so why not teach together? Also, many of the courses that are needed, let's say in Norway, are also needed in Sweden and Denmark and Finland and other countries. So why not teaming up? It, it can reduce the barrier. It can also ease the onboarding of new instructors because it can be less scary and less work to join a workshop that is, and there are other people already there. There are people who set up the, uh, the lessons. There, are, there is somebody there, like now Johan and Richard, who, who co-teach with me. If I forget something, they will help me out and they will fill in the gaps. So, so, so one aspect of, of this we teaching together uh, and uh, is this that you can re reach a, a broader audience. And uh, when devoting a, a lot of time and effort to, to develop good material and, and to practice good lessons, then uh, it's good if you also then can, can make use of it to, to larger audience. And I think for the, for the large uh, workshops that we have twice per year, we are not now up to towards 1,000. 500 participants in total that have attended. Um, and, and this is then also an opportunity to, to uh, I mean, to, to gradually improve on the content and, and also to, to uh, filter out all, all of the small glitches that you might have for the first time when, when you give up a course. And one, uh, one point that I just came, came to me and I think we didn't even mention it is that if we do courses together, we have to make them open. We have to make them accessible. Because if it's just my own course, well, I can have some PDF slides and it, they can be just on my hard drive and, and I share them upon request. But it's so much nicer to make the courses available, openly available, open source. And I think when working together with other countries and other organizations, there is no other way. So this is a nice byproduct. Of course, it comes at a price. So the challenges are, well, the more people, the more cooks in the kitchen, the more coordination of finding the partners with the same vision, coordinating. It means more meetings. It means more documents. And we have, I'm so grateful for all the manuals that we have. We have these operational manuals and this teaching material. So we, we need to have, we need to communicate more in writing and in, in talking. But it's also fun to, to, to teach with other people. Uh, co-teaching is challenging as, as it was pointed out in uh, it can be confusing as was pointed out on HackMD. it requires effort yeah, it, it requires um, um, a lot of preparations so that you can have a, a, a good flow uh, that also adopt a little bit to, the, to what happens on the HackMD. Um, but it's all often good to, that you have a scripted form of, of the content and with some chore choreography thought out. And when teaching with other people, it's such a great learning experience because so I learn a lot from watching how my colleagues teach, how they work, how they program. I think the best way to learn is to teach and maybe the easiest way to teach is to teach with others. So hopefully we can motivate you to, to join and to open up your courses to, to more audience and more contributors. Should we move on to the next section? Yes, let's do so. So in the next, here in this episode, we, we give two examples for, collabor for collaboration models where we have tried this. These are the Code Refinder workshops, but also um, we have tried this at least twice. Uh, when doing a multinational Python for scientific computing course. So which has started at Alto, at Alto University, but then uh, what they managed to do is to open it up, involve instructors from other countries who would contribute lesson material, who would bring in also learners. 
and it was a lot of fun. And we we already discussed some of the ideas, team registrations, local breakout rooms. And this way it's we can scale up the size, but also we can share the effort. Anything else I left out here? Hmm. So this was a lot of fun and um, I'm looking forward to more of this. Um, so in the autumn, I hope we will run another version of this. It really, for me, after I've seen this, it doesn't really make sense to develop something like this on my own. It really makes sense to team up. So should we now proceed to uh, discuss workshop roles that we need in conjunction with this kind of teaching? Mm -hmm. So as we scale up, um, as we scale up, we, so if you do a workshop with 10, 10 participants or 20 participants, it's maybe enough if you organize everything yourself and it maybe it can even be the same person organizing and teaching, but this doesn't work anymore as we scale to 40, 100, 300 people, even more as we start to record. And now we need uh, different roles. We, we need more people. So typically, you know, in our last workshop, we had we have 10 to 15 persons who are busy with organizing and instructing. And we have maybe 25 exercise leads. All of them need to be synchronized, onboarded. So there's onboarding to do, there's coordination to do. There is somebody coordinating the, the teaching part, there needs to be somebody coordinating the registration part. Then we have, now that we also live stream and we need video editing, broadcasting, we need the director who, who says that now camera one, now camera two, now we go to HackMD. Sometimes this is the same person. So in the past and also now, right now, director, broadcaster, video editor is is Richard, but as we will in future, we will need to um, distribute the workload. Mm -hmm. We have expert helpers. These are people who know the material very well. They have maybe taught it and they are there to support, uh, to answer questions, but also to support exercise leads. Exercise leads are people who are in the exercise rooms supporting learners when doing exercises. So we could perhaps uh, comment here about the scalability. So as Radovan mentioned, uh, there can be as many as 15 or even 20 persons who are, are uh, taking on these roles in total. Um, and when it comes to the number of participants, it's so that for, for, for the part of, of the workshops that we're doing in exercise rooms, uh, which can be done online or could also be now in, in hybrid uh, form where we have that people meet up and, uh, and, and form exercise groups on site on the campus, then um, the number of, of participants that, that, that we could host is dependent on the number of tentative exercise leads. So what we're doing is that we encourage people to sign up for the workshops in teams where then one person is then volunteering to be the guide to the others. It doesn't mean that that person needs to know all of, of the contents of the workshop, but they will learn on the go and also then be a person that feel confident in, 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 in guiding the others. Excellent point. And maybe before we move on, maybe two lessons learned from our past workshops is that when forming exercise groups, this has been administratively heavy and we we will in future try to make that easier. So we really of, uh, encourage team registrations or for individual learners so that they self-organize exercise groups. So we want to facilitate that. The other lesson learned is uh, I have tried to be registration coordinator and also instructor. And it is really good if it's not the same person. Yeah. It's good if instructors can focus on teaching because that's enough work already to prepare the lessons. And it's good if there is a dedicated person who manages all the registration because that at least for two, three weeks, it can be a full-time job. Anything else we want to say here before moving on? 
And I think we could probably move on. And then we will come to why are computers hard? Should I keep the screen share or does somebody want to take it from me? I'm happy to. Uh, I guess if you keep it, that might help. Yeah, you okay. can be scrolling and stuff like that. So the next few sections on socio-technical considerations, we aren't really going to spend that much time on. But the main point is that we should really think about when we're teaching, what is the biggest struggle? Is it getting the material to people? Or is it the way that computers are just, and user interfaces are usually designed quite badly? And we have all these people, like we're teaching both people that have been using computers, Linux, whatever, since they've been young in high school or earlier, and people that are just learning this. And somehow these factors really dominate the considerations of everything we are doing. Uh, I don't think there's really much more we can say right now. You can read these and there's some good links here, but we should move on forward by two and we get to lesson design and development. So lesson design and development. Um, yeah, so Johan, what do you think about the way we do lessons in Code Refinery with Git and all of that? What do you say are the biggest advantages and disadvantages? Yeah, so um, one big advantage is this that, so, so uh, an overall topic of, of, of the teaching that we're doing is to, uh, is to teach best practices in, in computing and in, in uh, and, and modern programming. And as is common today, in many, many software projects are nowadays being hosted in, in repositories uh, and, and, and often on, on uh, web services such as GitHub and, and GitLab, where you can have them either as private repositories or you can have them as public repositories so there's a good infrastructure here for collaborating on the contents and uh, what we're doing here in practice is that the lessons that we are doing are, are edited in markdown and in rsd using the sphinx templates and uh, this can then all be version controlled in, in git repositories yeah and uh, yeah. the material can so then be, be rendered both for viewing locally or be then displayed and this displayed and published online yeah. via for instance github actions so if we didn't use version control what would be the next best option like is there anything other than version control that can do everything we need does anyone like in the audience have any ideas so um does because once I was in some meeting and we were discussing how to make our lessons fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And really, the, when most people do things, if it's in some slide format that's not in version control, how do you get these? Um, like It's easy to publish something so other people can use it, but getting the changes back so you're not sort of just making lots of forks and everyone's going off their own way. Mm -hmm. I mean, besides version control, I really don't know what would work. Um, yeah, typically one, one then does end up in having like a static repository also to say, this is the version, this is the version of, of, of the lecture notes from 2018, and then you have from 2019 and so forth, more like snapshots. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I guess we'll also look at this a bit more in the next section. Um, yeah. Should we go on? I think the next section is backwards lesson design and development. And I think this is something really important that most people should, or more people should think about. So, so often we've seen someone wants to teach something. So you think, what do, how do I use the tool? 
or what do I find interesting about the tool. But for someone else who's just learning, this is often too hard of a place to start or too like, it's too abstract, technical, academic, whatever. The kind of skills that someone else needs to do in order to get started are really basic compared to what other people do. So as we see on the screen here, the idea of backwards lesson design is basically think of what the person will be able to do at the end, which is always just a small fraction of what you can do, but enough to get them started. And then design the lesson around that so that way they can do that. And I can say that things like the previous versions of these instructor trainings had the same problem. We went and we compiled a bunch of material about what it's like to be in code refinery and teach and so on, but we didn't consider the people who were, who were actually there, what would they like be interested in and need to do in one week or one month. Um, yeah, so by now, basically everything I do is backwards designed. I try to think of three points which someone should remember after any presentation or lesson and then build around that. Yeah, and, and, and one, so the material that, that we are preparing in, in our lessons can be used both during workshops in, in as, a, as a live event, but material is also very, very good um, learning material when you are or using it um, asynchronously at your learning at your own pace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, hands on practicing what we're learning is part of it. And, and I think it is with, uh, the, yeah, as mentioned here, the, 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 the phrase informative assessments and uh, that reflects on the way how we construct uh, exercises that we are really clear on, on what, what, what are the learning objectives and what is it that you will be able to do after walking through one exercise. It can sometimes be, be rather concrete, distinct things, um, and others yeah. are a bit more open-ended. Yeah. And I can also maybe say that the material can never be perfect. And also mm. our, our today's lesson is not perfect. Mm -hmm. It's a process. Oh, but but the wonderful thing is that it's open. Anybody can suggest improvements. We will improve this lesson as we go, but anybody can send pull requests, um, open issues. It's nice that we have issues and everything in the same place. And this way we can improve it as a community. Yeah. So should we go to the outro and summarize? Yes. And then we will should perhaps then slowly go off towards a break after the outro, I think. Yeah. So going with the three points thing, what are the three things that we'd like someone to get out of this? Um, let's see. To me, it's that the tools you use matter. And there's some things that are not obvious or take a little bit of preparation that you really should be looking at, like the vertical screen share, the team teaching, and things like that. Second, for me, I guess might be scaling to larger sizes isn't necessarily bad, because there's other strategies we can use that really make it work and keep it interactive. And what would be my last one? don't teach alone or something like that. Not just with one person, but with a large community. What do y'all think? And it doesn't have to be perfect. It, um, mm. So don't let the perfect be the, the enemy of the good. Yeah. Also, if sometimes we have problems that um, there are no shows, but since we record everything, it's still useful also for those who cannot participate today or are in a different time zone. So be less worried about teaching. I think it is that will, it will be very, very useful. Yeah. Uh, and so what's the future then? So what can you do? So if you as an individual would like to do something, you can join the Code Refinery chat we have. 
it's a little bit down below. Um, this is basically the way, the place we talk among each other and plan, coordinate, teach, whatever. You can join a workshop as someone who's leading a team, co-teaching, or help us to organize the whole thing. These are all very easy to do. Um, and generally, like, we really need people that can help us outreach and market and sort of reach a bigger audience. So as is usually the trap, we do a lot of things, but we don't communicate with it enough. So Radovan, at the organizational level, how do you think Code Refinery will evolve and how can someone be a part of this? Um, the way to contribute, I think what we need to do is um, we need to make it easier and explain better how individuals can join and how organizations can join. Mm -hmm. Also on a short term, um, commitment and one way to join one like low commitment way of joining the effort is to send a team or two to a workshop mm -hmm. send a exercise lead or two to the workshop and maybe give them time to contribute some of the work time to help out at the workshop and this way also to learn new new tricks and new tools and the way we can all help is to explain to our management, explain to to the research groups how this can be beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. And this way we can build a community and keep it going. Yeah. And I guess we'll talk more about this in the upcoming Zoom sessions. Yes, so after the break, we will uh, meet in Zoom. So you have got the Zoom link, either in the email, it's also in the HackMD. And there in the Zoom, nothing will be recorded and we can we can have a discussion, it will be more hands-on. We will talk about more about the tools and we will also have a roundtable discussion about some of, many of these topics that came up and many of these questions and challenges. Yes. So we have the break until uh, quarter past yeah. A full hour. That sounds great. And we will also add that info to the HackMD so that everybody knows when to when to be back and where. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I added it on the HackMD down below. So with that being said, thanks for everyone who was here and we will see you in 10, uh, 11 minutes in Zoom. Thanks so much. See you there. Yep. Okay. See you there. Great. Bye.